What's up, game players? How are you guys doing? God dog, think I lost my voice. I want to welcome you guys to the Analog Circle Podcast, episode number 68. I am your host, Key on Mitchell. And as always, I want to thank every single last one of you listeners out there for tuning in for taking the time out of your important day to spend some time with me that means everything and once again i want to thank you now guys as always if you want to get in contact with the show oh my goodness you know how to do it and if you don't There's two different ways. You can either call in, leave your name, leave the voicemail, and it will be played on the next podcast. And that number is 443-261-4607. Or if you don't feel like picking up the phone and reaching out to a brother, you can do it another way. You can email the show at the analog circle podcast at gmail.com. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Now, guys, you might want to know. Eh, probably not, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, what I've been into this week. Ah, brother, I'm going to tell you, man, this week I actually chilled. I'm going to tell you, I was out on the road quite a bit this week. Did roughly about 2,000 miles worth of driving in upstate New York. Uh, what I touched down in Ohio. Now that was last week. Anyway, yeah, this weekend came up. I just relaxed, sat back and relaxed because over the summer, I've been going almost every single weekend. It's been something to do, some event to go to. I was on vacation for almost 10 days, just loving life, having a good time. But as far as gaming goes, I'm still on the daggone Assassin's Creed, brother. Yeah, brother. But the good news is I am finally at the last Boss, and he is kicking me in the daggone uh, rumper right now, but it's okay, I'm going to get him. And after I finish that game, a matter of fact, I think I'm going to put it up on YouTube. That's right, guys, go over to the YouTube channel. It's under the Analog Circle Podcast. Go over there. Some videos are up there. Yeah, yeah, so is the show. Also, to let you guys know, I'm on Twitch. Ah, the Twitch stream isn't that great. I actually went out, tried to see how much a PC would be to actually be able to stream at a high quality. Uh, buddy, let me tell you something, man. The PC that this guy recommended to me that could be a just one and done, at least for a couple years, it cost $13.99. $13.99. Now, granted, it comes with a uh, NVIDIA 10, uh, 1070 already in there, had like 16 gigs of RAM, terabyte hard drive, i7 core processor. I mean, it was kind of a somewhat of a beast, but I really had to make some life decisions. And I had to tell him I'm going to have to pause on that, brother. That's a little aggressive right now. But outside of that, I went on to Best Buy and uh, picked up Uncharted The Lost Legacy. I'm telling you, if you don't already have it, go to Best Buy and get the Gamers Unlocked card. I'm telling you, I paid like 32 bucks for the game. $32. You pay, what is it, 30 or $35 for three years do it, and I want to say this. I'll, I just want to put this out there. Uh, Best Buy is not giving me a nickel for um, plugging that, but I believe in that so much that I think any gamer out there, any game player that wants to get games at a good discount, brand new, go to Best Buy. 
Also, some other news popped up while I was at Best Buy because I initially went there because they were saying that the Xbox One X is going to be on display at Best Buy. So you might want to check into your local area to see if it's coming to a Best Buy near you. Now, I went up there, and of course, the guy that was helping me he said, well, we haven't got word yet, but wink, wink, I'm pretty sure we're going to get it. So I said, all right, I'll check back in like two or three weeks just to try to get some hands on time with the machine. Now, he also hit me with another bit of news that I wasn't ready for. I didn't think it was going to happen. I didn't think it was possible. But he said that they had some Nintendo Switches in the building. Whoa! Six of them to be exact. And once again, here I go. Having to make some life decisions. Gaming life decisions. Do I pay this bill that is uh, over my head right now or do I go get a switch? Well, of course, I said, look, man, I got to pay this bill, brother. But if you have some left in maybe two or three weeks, ah, maybe a month, I may return and pick one up. But anyway, anyway, I have blabbered on way, way too much, guys. But what I want to do now is get into, this is going to be a lengthy episode. God, dog, we almost at six minutes and 30 seconds, and I'm still in the intro. But I have to get into, oh, my goodness, bro. I got to get into the feedback section. And my goodness, I got two emails. Man, you know if I get anything outside of one, shout out to Cody Clark. Because he holds down this section of the podcast. But if I get more than one, oh my gracious, it is a real gift. A gift. So guess who wrote in this week? I'm going to read his first because it's a little lengthy. My man Jeremy Parrish wrote in. This week, man, you guys might not remember what the question was last week. I was asking you guys, are games more fun on easy or hard difficulty? Now, this is what Jeremy had to say, and this is lengthy, and I'm going to try to get on through it without butchering his email too bad. But he starts off with saying, Keys, what's up, man? I started to call in but realized that you would convey my feelings more enthusiastically (laughs) than I ever could. So here's an email. There definitely is a certain feeling of accomplishment that comes with beating a game on hard, especially back in the day. The hard setting gave you something to reach for, a special ending, an added quest, a new outfit. It seems that today, though, like you said, since games are more story-driven, it seems the level of difficulty has become more streamlined. Now, so that everyone gets the same storyline, the games are, quote-unquote, dumbed down oh that hurts now the challenge is in collecting everything is that a fair trade-off it depends if i'd like to learn more about the story the extras it may be worth exploring the world looking for all the easter eggs or collecting 100 of this or that but if it feels tedious doing these search and collecting missions, then it would be better to add a hard setting to give that player something extra. It's only fair. The problem, I guess, is when the game becomes too hard or it cheats, as we like to say. That's never fun. When the only way to progress in a game is to memorize AI patterns through repeat death over and over and over again you lose the fun this ain't edge of tomorrow buddy and i'm not tom cruise it should be possible 
to think. <laughs> I got to laugh at that. Oh, man, I lost my train of thought. Okay. It should be possible to think things out without having to die in the game. But it should be balanced. Too many games today that are released are just too easy. Even on normal, a game should be challenging, but it's best when it is intellectually stimulating. Those are my personal favorites. But I guess sometimes some people just like an impossible fight. Not me. You can keep your ninja gating, I'm good. Hey, Jeremy, man, let me tell you, this was a good email, brother. You know, I, you know, I actually got into a heated debate this weekend. Shout out to, uh, my nephew Darian. He gave me a call and he was very upset about this. He said that I was portraying the wrong message that you guys should be playing these games on normal. And I'm only saying this because he brought up some good points. Now notice I never said that you should play the game on, on easy. I said it's been times when I have said, man, look, I got to get this done. I want to swing on through. I'm going to knock it out. And that was that. But getting back to Jeremy's point, I like what you said, brother. You know, it is, we do live in a time where the games are more story driven. Gone are those Nintendo days where the game was impossible. I'm going to tell you this, Jeremy. Goodness, you know, the, the, the collectibles, the extra content, having to go through the game to get little pieces here and there. Yeah, that's cool. But like you said, when they make certain challenges of things too hard where it's an unfair fight, I am not, and I repeat, I am not amused at all. People love Dark Souls 3. Yeah, it's hard. Dark Souls, period. Even Bloodborne. They say it's easier. I say, hey, whatever. But people enjoy the challenge. I'm going to tell you, Jeremy, you were also right. It is something. It, it is a bit of an accomplishment. A great feeling when you beat a game that not everybody has beaten. Case in point for me. I would say in recent memory. This is just recent. Over the last few years, this generation, I would say the hardest game that I beat, and I absolutely loved it because it was a grind. Darn, it was hard. Was Ori in the Blind Forest. When I beat that game, let me tell you, it definitely, definitely was a heck of a feeling of accomplishment. But the thing I enjoyed about that game was... It felt fair. Any mistake that I made, it felt like it was my fault. So it made it a lot easier for me to get through those harder parts and stick with the game because the controls were buttery smooth. So if there was a mistake made, it was 100% on my hands. No pun intended. But Jeremy... I appreciate you, brother, writing in to the show. This is fantastic. And by all means, please don't make this your last time. Thank you again. Now, moving into the next email. Of course, you guys know who it is. It is Mr. Cody Clark. Now, the name of his email is, is this easy mode? Uh, what else? Overwatch quote. Oh, DVA Overwatch quote. Oh, must be a character. I see I butchered it. God dog. I'm going to get into it, Cody. Here we go, brother. He says, remember back in the day when some games would lock out story modes or endings if you only beat the game on easy mode or whatever? I never understood that. I don't like difficulty. It is like one of those things I don't want to think about. 
I sort of enjoy the mutators or whatever that some games put in where you could change how much damage you take or how the enemies react and stuff. Like Ultima didn't have, like Ultima didn't have a difficulty slider. MMOs don't have one, but EverQuest is way more crazy and unforgiving than World of Warcraft or SWTOR. Heck, Forza 5 was free on Xbox Live, so I picked it up and moved the difficulty down to easy, and I get penalized 5% for doing that. I don't know. I don't see the appeal of doing something on super, mega, legendary mode. If it is fun, it is fun. I do like when they up the rewards for difficulty. You know, farming those epic items or whatever. But otherwise, I just don't enjoy the idea of making games harder or more easy. Because if I don't set my life to more quote-unquote easy modes, IRL, I would. I mean, I've... Already got it pretty easy, but that is just me. Path of least resistance. Cody! Brother! Thank you once again. It's always greatly appreciated when you write in, brother. You know, it. you always have something interesting to say every single message, brother. So let's get into it real quick. Now, I, I will say... Cody, you know, one thing you pointed out, which is very interesting to me, is uh, about Forza. When you actually put it on easy mode, it actually penalized you 5% for doing that. I can, you know, some people may not agree, but me, myself, I can understand the stance on it because they're, they're, they're actually deducting points because you're not, I guess, being quote unquote challenged enough. Now, whether that's fair or not, hey, that's the developer's decision. I do believe, though, that if people are playing these games, similar to what Jeremy was bringing up, if you're going to play a game on hard difficulty, you should get some really cool stuff. For your hard effort and time going through a game that could have killed you over and over, like Jeremy said. You know, so I can understand that point. But like you said, if the game is fun, which is my point, if you're having fun with the game, that should be all that matters. It doesn't matter if it's on easy. It shouldn't matter if it's on normal. It shouldn't matter if it's on hard. I guess it all comes down to preference, which was why I wanted to bring up this question. Because for me, I have such a far, long, long backlog. And I'm just trying to get through. I have literally about 17 17 to 20 games that are on backlog that I have either played an hour in or haven't played at all. I, 10 of them I know I haven't touched yet. I got Hellblade. I have not touched the game yet. And Cuphead is coming out this Friday, and I'm going to get that too. Now that, oh, man, let's, re, let, 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 let's come back to this hard difficulty situation because I think this is perfect timing. Cuphead is coming out on Friday and we know for a fact that that game is going to be relentless and brutal. I hope that you listeners out there that are getting Cuphead will either call in or write in and say if that difficulty is taking away the fun of the game for you. I would love to hear that. Let's revisit it. I'm going to get it. I'll play it. And I'll let you guys know how I feel. Because I've heard, once again, it is so doggone hard. Now I want to tell you, Cody, I have, man... We almost 20 minutes in, and I'm just getting ready to get started in the game and news. But, Cody, as always, brother, 
like you said, least path of resistance for you. If it's fun and you're having a good time, that's all that matters. But Cody, as always, brother, thank you so much for writing in with your emails on the weekend, week out basis. And to you, Jeremy, as well, brother, I want to say thank you again for writing in because the feedback is everything. Man, let me tell you, when you guys reach out, you know, I know it may seem small to you guys and it's like, man, it's just an email. What, 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 what does that really matter? You know, it, it means a lot. Interactivity is amazing. You know, when, when a person knows that somebody out there is interested. So I, I truly thank you again, Cody, for your consistency. And I truly thank you as well, Jeremy, for writing in. Like I said, it, it means everything, but no need to get sappy and all of that stuff. So guys, we have been rambling on and on and well, I have actually, <laughs> but guys, let's go ahead. Oh my gracious and get into what we all come here for. And this show is going to be long this week. And that is for the gaming news da, 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 that went down this week. Now, for Monster Hunter fans, there has finally been more info that has come out about the game. Now, the game will release on January 26th. 2018 and will have different versions to choose from upon release. Now, one of these includes the digital deluxe edition that comes with hairstyles, emblems, and armor sets, as well as a emote. Or you can go with the physical collector's edition, which will come with the game a soundtrack CD, an art box, and a figure of the game's new box art monster. Now, pre-orders actually started on September 20th, if you weren't aware. So for any of you guys out there that are Monster Hunter fans, go ahead, pre-order this, pick up one of these copies of the game. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. I saw the box sets, and of course, this information was from Tokyo Game Show where they were talking about this. And one other thing, golly, one cool thing, I almost forgot to mention this, was uh, they had a PS4 Pro theme bundle that is only available in the West. Now, it was selling for 49.950 yen, but that equals out to roughly about $450 in U.S. currency. So did I say the West? I meant to say the East. Think the East, I believe. You know what I'm saying. God darn it. Geography's off. But yeah, they were uh, talking about it. Man, it looks awesome. So I don't know if that's going to come here to the States. I don't think that Monster Hunter is really big here in the States like that. But that PlayStation 4 Pro bundle does look very appetizing. Moving on to the next story at hand. Now, Sonic, oh man, Sonic has propelled himself back into a positive light with gamers lately due to the latest installment in the franchise, which is Sonic Mania. People have been going banana bonkers over this game. Well, we know that isn't the only Sonic game coming out this year, and hopefully the next installment Sonic Forces, which is up next, will follow in the same footsteps as Sonic Mania. But already there are positive signs of this happening, of this being a good game, because for the first time in quite a few years, Shadow the Hedgehog will be playable in the game via a free DLC, which will include three stages total. That will, that will follow Shadow. Now, now, now on a side note, it doesn't look like he will be wielding his guns in this version, his dual guns. But outside of that, the game releases on November 7th. Now, I have to say, I have been seeing a very positive trend 
in the gaming culture lately. Free DLC. DLC has been free a whole lot more in this generation than, uh, I should say not in this generation, but at this time in any generation since last generation. You have EA giving out free DLC. You have Rockstar giving out free DLC. Heck, you have Capcom with Resident Evil 7 giving out free DLC. This is great. And I say that I think this is a result of game players actually voting with their wallets. When people say no to the DLC, I'm not going to pay you for something that should be in the game. It, se it seems like it's working. I'm not going to say it's never going to be uh, any payable DLC ever because that's not going to happen. It's always going to be paid DLC. But I do like the trend that we're seeing that these companies, these gaming companies are willing to throw out some some free DLC every once in a while. And this one looks pretty lengthy. Three stages. Now, I don't know how big the stages are. They may be the size of a bonus stage in a Sonic game. I don't know. I can't speak on that. But the fact that they're free and they're giving you Shadow for free, that's a pretty good positive in my humble, very humble opinion. Now, moving on to another story. Now, this, oh, man, this really caught me off guard. I don't know if any of you heard of this, but there was a game called Planet of the Apes, The Last Frontier, being developed by a company called Imaginati, I believe that's the name of it, Imaginati Studios. Now, the guy leading this project, his name is called Mark All Times, that's right, last name is All Times, yeah, said he took inspiration from Until Dawn heavy rain and life is strange now of course those three games have two things in common they don't focus heavily on gameplay but they do put an emphasis on story which brings me back to what the game is which it's a choose your own path game where it's been said quote unquote there is no right or wrong decisions. This game is supposed to release this fall, but no concrete date has been given. Now, it's also being said the game will sell for $30, and it releases on the Xbox One, the PlayStation 4, and Steam. Now, it uses the Unreal Engine. Now, really quickly, the game does, now this is kind of cool, the game does take advantage of Sony's PlayLink, which means you can use your smartphone to make decisions. Now, now I did, I, mm, whoa, almost, I forgot to mention, All Times wants this to be a couch co-op experience. Now, I looked at the trailer for this game. And I got to say, look, anybody that's listened to the podcast, you guys know I went dug on Gaga over Until Dawn. I loved Heavy Rain. I didn't get into Life is Strange. I didn't really, eh, you know, playing as a teenager, I, you know, I nah, didn't really, really appeal to me. But Until Dawn and Heavy Rain, if he is taking cues from those two games which had very good storylines gameplay was basically a lot of qtes and you know just minimal i mean minimal movements just moving around the environment picking up things almost like a modernized point and click game kind of a uh, gameplay mechanic to it but they were so enjoyable. And the thing that I loved about those two games was it was so many different outcomes for each of the characters. They really had different outcomes, which I remember beating Heavy Rain three times. I never do this with a game unless it is amazing for me. I beat Heavy Rain three times and got three different 
endings. So if he is actually bringing those elements to this game that already sounds very interesting, I can't wait. And the fact that he wants this to be a couch co-op experience and he's making it so you can use the play link to make decisions on your phone and not have to hold the pad in your hand, the controller in your hand. This could lead to some debates if you have your friends or your girl around or, you know, you got some of your buddies over and y'all are playing through the game and somebody wants to make one decision and they're like, no, 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 what about the humans though? And they're like, oh, forget the humans, man, it's about the apes. You know, I mean, it could lead into some really, really cool stuff. So I'm so excited to hear more about this game. Definitely check it out. Look it up. It looks pretty promising. Woo! Let me wipe my brow. I'm hot, man. Hold on, man. A little sweaty right now. Let me wipe myself off. All right. On to the next story. Now, oh, 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 man. Woo! Now, do any of you remember the game that was directed by Hideo Kojima, and no, not Metal Gear, no, not Snatcher or Police Knots, no, none of them. He has made, well, I should say directed, another game outside of those. How about, I'm sure you guys guessed it, Zone of Enders, yes, the PlayStation 2 Classic is coming back, sort of. Yeah, not a new game. Now, the game is getting a remastered version on PlayStation 4. And well, now this is the coolest feature ever. It's going to feature VR support and will boast enhanced graphics and 4K resolution support as well as next gen surround sound. Now, it's being called Anibis Zone of Enders Mars. This game is going to be released in 2018. I don't know how many of you guys actually picked up Zone of Enders. I remember I picked up Zone of End Enders strictly off the strength of it coming with a Metal Gear Solid demo. If my memory serves me correctly, because I was a little skeptical. I mean, I saw Kojima's name on the box. I said, it can't be that bad. It's Kojima. He's not going to put out trash. And I said, you know what? If that, that game, it gave me the extra boost that I needed to go ahead and try it. And I really liked it a lot. What was the, uh, the, 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 the robot's name? Jehoyote? Jehoyote? Something like that. I don't know. It's been over almost 20 years ago, man. But it was so good. I enjoyed it so much. I'm very excited for this game to come back because I always thought, even though they did make a sequel, I always thought Zone of Enders had more life in it, but it just never, to me, seemed like it got that fair shake. But it did get a sequel, so uh, maybe it did, and maybe it just didn't hit with everybody, because back then, what was it, Gundam, that was popping, you know, Virtual On was out at that time. I mean, it was all about the mechs at one point in gaming, and I thought that Kojima did such a great job with Zone of Enders. I'm very excited to see how this re master comes out and the fact that you can play it in vr playstation vr this is going to be hopefully hopefully it's going to be great because in the vr mode being in a mech oh man you know it's going to feel like you're floating in the air you're flying you're dashing you're moving around i think it's going to be spectacular now hopefully like i said Hopefully, it does well, and it deserves to do well because it'll be a good game. Let's hope that they don't drop the ball on this. I don't know how they could because the groundwork has already been laid. But Zone of Enders 2018, who knows? Who the heck knows? Maybe, just maybe they're testing the water for another one. Moving on to the next story, we're going to get into some Final Fantasy 15 news. Now, if anyone looking for a reason, if you're looking for a reason, 
to revisit Final Fantasy 15, there will be a multiplayer DLC arriving on October 31st, 2017. Now, this DLC will allow you to create your own custom character and fight monsters with your friends. Now, before you consider downloading this DLC, it has been said that the DLC will take place after, I want to put emphasis on it, after chapter 13. So if you don't want the story spoiled, I would recommend making it pass chapter 13 before you dive into this DLC. Now, this didn't say it was free. This DLC, you're probably going to have to pay for it, but I do like the fact that it's multiplayer. I'm going to tell you, Square Enix, man, they have broken some of their codes on this game. Now, granted, they've had Final Fantasy Online. That's nothing new. That's That's been around since the 360 era, so the multiplayer side of it is not new. But I do like the fact that this game was a single-player game, and they added the multiplayer DLC to it because they see that that is where the gaming culture is shifting. Now, you guys know I'm not into multiplayer like that. It's not really my thing, but it's no denying that the culture, the gaming culture is shifting in that direction. And I will say this. Square Enix being who they are, you know, a, 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 the, um, kind of developer they are. I will say I'll give them credit for keeping up with the times and not falling so far behind. Final Fantasy 15, they took a lot of chances. They got rid of the turn based system, which I thought was for the best. I enjoyed playing, well, the demo, that's another game I have that I have not opened. It's on my shelf. I've not touched it. It's been in a wrapper for almost a year now. I got it in November of last year. Still haven't opened it up, but I got it off of the strength of the demo that I played that I thought was terrific. So for you Final Fantasy 15 fans, be on the lookout October 31st, 2017 now moving on oh man this got me excited Woo! it got me pumped now in rockstar news we're all looking forward to red dead redemption 2 of course i know i am i mean john marston was my guy goodness i loved it but but info has been scarce but maybe just Maybe that's about to change because in a tweet Rockstar put up on Thursday, which was September, which they had said, I'm sorry, darn, butchered that, God dog. They put up a tweet that said, be on the lookout for Thursday, September 28th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. They didn't say any more than that. Could we be getting a Red Dead Redemption 2 release date on Thursday, September 28th? Or, or, oh man, this would be just terrible. Or, are they just giving us new DLC for God Dog on GTA 5? That would just ruin it. I mean, I'm hoping that this tweet has some weight. Now, we know that it's been some tweets that have been sent out that have not measured up to the excitement level that we thought they would once they came to fruition. But Rockstar, you have to know, I know they know, people are looking for Red Dead Redemption 2 in the daylight with a flashlight. They're trying to find it. And they want it in their homes. They want it in their hands. So hopefully... On September 28th at 11 a.m., they will be releasing some very, very big news. Could it be a new trailer for Red Dead Redemption 2 that may end with a release date? That would be amazing. I'm hoping, man. I'm very, very hopeful that they won't drop the ball on this and we'll get a very, very exciting announcement moving on into some halo news
Jets. Now, Halo, you will be able to actually uh, be able. God darn it. Let me, let me get it together. Okay. Now, you will be able to play four Halo games on your Xbox One via backwards compatibility. Now, those games are as follows. Halo 3. Halo 3 ODST, Halo 4, and Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary. Now, it has also been said that the games will be available eventually digitally. This is really cool. I mean, I don't know anyone personally who will use this. That's me. I don't know anyone personally that will be using the backwards compatibility with these games because you had Halo, uh, what was it, uh, the, the, the anniversary Halo Master Chief Edition that came out that has all of the Halos on it minus five. And well, it doesn't have ODST on there. So that's something, that's something right there. But, Either way, I like the fact that Microsoft is continuing. They're continuing this trend of making sure that they're supporting the backwards compatibility. Matter of fact, I think one of the latest backwards compatible games was either Saints Row 3 or 4. That's now backwards compatible. I think that came out last week sometime, that news, but that's another one. So, like I said, I like the trend. They're continuing it, and they're making sure that they're supporting that feature in the console. Just like Via on the PlayStation 4. I love the fact, even though it's not mainstream, more people are not checking for it that are... But the VR, I like the fact that Sony is still making sure that they have games coming out that are VR compatible. So eventually, I think that once that price point goes down and stops being so aggressive, like I said, $300 for the Move controllers, the camera, and the VR headset, I think that's a much better sweet spot as far as people starting to gravitate to it. But nonetheless, I appreciate the fact that Sony is not giving up on the technology, and they have been supporting it way more than I was expecting them to. But moving on into some more gaming news. Now, are you guys familiar with the Chinese room? Yeah, yeah, the Chinese room. Uh Uh-huh. Well, not not a literal Chinese room. It is a studio, a gaming studio that is behind games like Dear Esther, Amnesia, Machine for Pigs, or what about uh, the newest game that they had come out, Everybody's Gone to Rapture. Well, it was announced by co-founder Dan Pinchbeck that, uh, man, the studio will be going silent. For a while. Here is his official statement, and I quote There's an interview coming out tomorrow in Eurogamer where I talk at length about the ups and downs of being a small developer and the challenges you face as a business owner and employer as well as a game maker. It's centered around the news that for the immediate future, We're going dark as a studio. End of quote. Now, it's been said that layoffs actually began in June when their latest VR project, which is entitled, and I quote, So Let Us Melt, was finishing up. Now, man, you know, I always, I hate to hear these kind of stories. I mean, it doesn't look like they're actually shutting down. But when people are being laid off of their jobs, it's always a bad situation. Nobody wins in that situation because when you're doing layoffs, that means you're doing cutbacks. And the reason why you're doing cutbacks is because the money isn't there. So this is very sad news. And I'm sorry to hear that they're going to be silent for a while. They're going to be reworking some things, I guess, behind the scenes. But if you guys want to get, you know, a deeper understanding of this, like I said, go on to Eurogamer. It should be up by now, the actual interview, to get some deeper details about it. I just 
didn't get a chance to go over and look at it. But yeah, it's very sad. Um, actually, they were saying that this could be because of the fact that all of their games pretty much are the same kind of game, which is niche. Uh, I don't know if they're walking simulators or, or what, but they, they're kind of niche. It's not something like a first person shooter or a third person, you know, adventure game. You know, it's, it's on, on another wave they got going on right now. So, you know, we'll see what happens. Hopefully these guys, they'll be able to bounce back and they'll be able to come back with another great, great title. And like I said, hopefully this VR project, uh, so let us melt will be excellent and hopefully it can get them back on track. Moving on to some more. Oh man, some more news. This is Xbox news. Oh shucks. Now I'm sure you guys and you might be saying why the heck is he so pumped it's not because it's xbox okay okay it's not because of that but this is a cool story man now i'm sure you guys remember the duke controller from the original xbox well it was rumblings you guys might have remembered this i don't know you might not be i don't know but it was rumblings about this controller making a comeback the duke controller well it is official According to a tweet sent out from Mr. Seamus Blackley, who said, and I quote, this is his quote from the tweet, hashtag new Duke has gone to tooling and is approved by at Xbox. This is happening. He put that in big, bold letters. This is happening now. That's the end of the quote, by the way. Now, I will say, ha, I didn't find the official release date or price of this, but it's being rumored to release in the holiday season. Now, the thing that has me so pumped up about this announcement is one of the coolest things that I saw with this controller that I have never seen is where the Xbox, you guys, if you guys remember the Duke controller, where the Xbox logo was on that original controller, it is now an LED screen and actually shows the original Xbox startup screen animation on the front of the controller you turn it on if you guys remember the xbox used to have those boiling uh green uh uh, uh some kind of slime or something i'm not really uh uh what is it illustrating it perfectly but for you guys that had an original xbox just remember how the screen used to come on with the electricity and then the xbox logo came to the front after the electricity was ripping through the controller has that on it I said, get the heck out of here, man. I wasn't even really interested in the controller too much because I wasn't a huge Duke controller fan. I preferred the S controller quite a bit more. But when I saw the boot up for that controller, I said, dag on it, brother. I am in. This is amazing. I It might just do that. But see, my imagination. See, I didn't stop there. No, my imagination said, what if, similar to how the Dreamcast used to do with the VMUs, the memory cards, some games you played, you would get these actual pixelated animations on the screen, which was mind-blowing back then. It was amazing. Where it would show the character on the screen. He might just be doing a cartwheel flip. He wouldn't be doing much of anything, but he was on the screen. I started thinking, what if they took that controller? With that LED screen and with certain games, you could get like actual display information through the LED screen. Case in point, okay, okay, you're playing Madden, all right? And your friend is on the couch, you're playing couch uh, versus each other, and you don't want him to see your play. What if, just what if, okay? This is all hypothetical. But what if on the screen, the LED screen, the plays actually showed up 
on the controller so he couldn't see what play you're going to do next. Or what if on Halo, as things are happening, you know, you're shooting the enemies and all of a sudden it may show, I don't know, uh, your, your energy, I don't know, uh, some kind of, uh, uh, what do you say, alien animation or something i don't know you know maybe a helmet on the screen and as you get beat up the helmet starts to show more and more damage on the led screen i mean there's some possibilities here man it could be something special now i don't know like i said with the led screen on a controller i'm 100 percent sure that this controller is not going to be very very cheap like i said no price point has been given but the fact that they have a LED screen on it, hopefully, hopefully Microsoft utilizes that screen and gives you some cool stuff on the screen that pops up when you're playing certain games. I mean, it would be awesome. I mean, use your imagination. This could be great. Anyway, I've rambled on about this too much. Let's move in to some... <coughs> Nintendo news. Now, last week, I'm sure you got, God dag, I want that controller, man. Darn it. All right, let me get, let me get back focused. All right. Now, last week, I'm sure you guys saw what I saw on the Nintendo front. And that was, this is so interesting. Now that was the 8-bit, it was the 8-bit Nintendo golf game being discovered on the Switch. But the game was not playable. So, you know, since people were saying they didn't know how to play it, they knew it was on the system, you know, it was under flog, which is golf spelled backwards. They said, you know, they, they didn't know how to unlock it. So I said, well, bump it. I'm not going to cover it. But it has been a new discovery about this. Now, uh, some new information has come out. And this, it, this, and it's quite, it's quite interesting and heartfelt. I really, um, really just botched that. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, it's very interesting and heartfelt. This new information that came out pertaining to this situation. Now, a person by the name of Yellow Eight discovered the only way you can unlock the game is on July 11th which was the day that former president Satoru Iwata passed away, unfortunately. Now, it has been said that this game was one that he worked on. So this is, you know, such a fitting way to remember one of their previous leaders. Now, if you're thinking you can just wait a minute, wait, hold on. Let me just let me just pause right there. You know, I, I have been very hard on Nintendo. You guys have heard me. I have, you know, jumped on Reggie's case. I've jumped on Nintendo, you know, just, you know, doing certain antics that I just do not like and things that just seem so unnecessary and very, um, unconsumer friendly, you know, just things that are just horrible, not having the Nintendo, uh, many in stock for enough people to get, etc. But anyway, I've been very hard on them, but lately they've been really starting to make me a fan of them again, like a genuine fan of Nintendo, like actually rooting for them. Just the fact that Nintendo allowed for their, their mascot, their biggest mascot, one of, one of the absolute biggest and most iconic characters in gaming. To actually be in a game with other characters, the rabbits. I said, this is amazing. And Nintendo let Ubisoft take their biggest game character and, you know, um, actually develop a game with their game and combine them together. I said, that shows so much growth because I remember a Nintendo that would have never let anyone touch any of their ips ever so for them to do that i thought that was fantastic and the fact that they're starting to get 
third party support. They're putting more mature games on their console, which is nothing new. They've tried to do it before. And like I said, they just don't sell as well. But the fact that they're trying and they sound or seem, I should say, like they're listening to their 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 fan base, they, they're doing great. I think Nintendo is in a very positive, they're starting to move into a positive light for me personally. And, you know, getting back to the, the fact, just, well, the point, I should say, just this alone, actually putting a game inside of the Switch that Mr. Iwata worked on, you know, as a, a remembrance of this man who gave so many years to this company, to, for them to honor him in this way, I said, man, I'm a, you know, I'm a little touched, man. This is, this is really dope of Nintendo to do. So I, I just want to say, Nintendo, that was awesome. And I commend y'all for doing that. Now, uh, all for the sappy stuff, man. Now, I want to get back to this a, as far as how you can unlock it. Now, this is where it gets very, very interesting. Now, if you're thinking you can just manually set your switch to July 11th and play the game, <laughs> like I said, you may want to listen up. Now, if your system has ever been connected to the internet, the Flog emulator, aka Golf, uh, will know the real date and ignore any manual clock change to July 11th. Now you can only cheat and reset the system date manually if you have a fresh system that has never done an internet time check or if the switch's internal clock battery is disabled or dies. Now, I did find, because I still wasn't 100% sure if this was all factual, but I did find the YouTuber by the name of Fire3Element. Now, it's F-I-R-E, the number three, Element, who went through a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to unlock the game, and it was definitely real deal he did this motion it's the certain motion that Iwata Mr. Iwata used to do where he would take his hands from out from 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 his chest in the outward uh uh direction and then bring him back and he actually did that with the switch controllers in his hand and it actually unlocked the game and it was the controls everything the the uh the what do you call it? The um motion controls, everything showed up. And when he unlocked it, it said success. And Mr. Iowata's voice, man, it was so darn cool. So if any of you, and I'm sure most of you have already connected it to the internet, but for any of you guys that may be getting a switch like myself who have not connected it to the internet or it hasn't, you know, um been formatted, Definitely change the date to July 11th and you will be able to unlock the original Nintendo game golf. This was so dope, man. And like I said, if you need a tutorial, go over to YouTube and look for Fire 3 Element. Nintendo, you're making me proud, brother. You're doing great. Moving on to some more Nintendo news. Now, the Super Nintendo Mini. Now, this is, ah, uh, man, uh, you know, this is when I start sweating because I'm happy about what Nintendo is doing, but the Super Nintendo Mini releases this week on September 29th. Now, Nintendo has also said that their Super Nintendo Mini was supposed to cancel by the end of the year, but has since said it will produce them into 2018. And on a side note, here we go again, more third-party support for Nintendo. I just put this on, on a sidebar. One of my favorite 
indie games that I beat that was excellent. Inside, the game Inside is coming to the Nintendo Switch. It's coming to the Switch and I believe, what is it, 2018. So they snagged another one, which is great. And I don't know if Inside is a mature game. It is a mature-esque kind of game because some of the deaths that the poor boy has, he has some gruesome, gruesome death scenes. So I would say it borderlines M rating, but man, it's another one. So Nintendo, God dog, man, y'all think, I think they need to be saluted. I know not everybody is going to feel this way. And like I said, I'm not 100% in Nintendo's corner just yet, but I have to give credit where it's due. They're getting these games. Yes, they may be releasing a little later, like Wolfenstein, uh, the Colossus, uh, that's coming out next year in 2018. But the game looks, it looks good for it to be on a handheld console. It looks good. So Nintendo picking up another one inside, which was excellent and amazing game. I think I gave it a, 8 or 8.5 when I finished it, but it was fantastic. Now, the thing is, Reggie fils like I said before, he said that these Super Nintendo minis don't pay the scalper prices. They're going to have enough of them to go around. Now, this is the moment where if Nintendo can do what they say and they can make enough of these, to go around where people don't have to worry about soon as they hit the store shelves, pick them up. And if you missed it, you got to go on eBay to get it at a high price. If they can circulate these evenly and put everybody on an even playing field, then I'll, I, 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 I'll, I'll wash my hands. I'll say Nintendo, you're back at least. And some pretty good graces of mine if they can pull this off. That's the test that I'm waiting to see. If these are readily available on the shelves, and, I, and I'm expecting for the first run of the consoles to get ate up. I mean, just swallowed whole. I'm not expecting to get one. Even on the second run, I'll give them a pass for the second run. But by the time that third run comes up, if they're still scarce... I'm going to start questioning, you know, but we'll see how it goes. I've rambled and gave this way too much attention, but uh, yeah, just stay the course, Nintendo. Like I said, you're doing great. Now, this is Nintendo related, you know, but it's uh, it's not a Nintendo console. This is actually, actually, this is the last story for this week. This is kind of a Nintendo heavy week. Now, let's get into some Super Mario Run news. Yeah. Now, I'm sure you have heard that even though the Android and the iOS game was downloaded 150 million times, most consumers were not willing to spend the $10 on the game. Well, maybe, just maybe, this news may grab your interest. Now, there is a new update coming this Friday where uh, Nintendo announced that they would be introducing a new world, a new mode, and a new playable character who is Daisy. Oh, wait, whoa, wait, Daisy? Yeah, yeah, uh, y'all didn't want to put Peach in there? Oh, oh, all right, what was Daisy? Who is Daisy, man? Is Daisy Peach's sister or cousin or... Or a strange sister. Or I, I, what's going on with Daisy? I don't know. Anyway, Daisy is going to be the character. Uh, now, the new world entitled World Star will unlock after completing the first six and will be comprised of nine new levels. There, you will also find new enemies and gameplay mechanics. Now, you will also have the option, this is pretty cool, you'll actually have the option to listen to your own music 
And when that happens, you will see Mario and other characters wearing headphones. I think that's pretty cool. Now, the most important thing to me, though, I'm going to tell you this, most important thing to me is Nintendo will be knocking the price of the game down by 50%, where the, that's going to, of course, it's basic math, it's going to knock the game down to four ninety nine. And that's going to be available from, this is not permanent, but you have from September 29th, which I believe is a Friday, until October 12th to get the game at $4.99. And you will get all of this bonus content. You're going to get Daisy. You're going to get the new worlds, you, you know, the new mode. I think that's a darn good deal. $5 and you're getting way more content. What did it say? What? Nine new places? Nine new levels? Five bucks? Sounds good to me. But that, my friends, my game players, is the gaming news for the week. Oh, man. Oh, buddy. Y'all don't understand, brother. I'm over here sweating all the time. Man, got to wipe my brow. Again, let me get my handkerchief, man. God, dog. Man. All right, guys. Well, you guys know what it is. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to get some water or OJ or something. And uh, we will return after this week's video game theater. Stay tuned, guys. Stay tuned. is with the Templar Admiral on the lead ship, Captain. Once he gives the orders, it will be lost. The parcel itself is less interesting than its intended recipient. Let's eliminate this errand boy, Admiral, and unmask the true Templar threat. When I became an assassin, I swore to leave piracy behind. But the old methods have served the creed more than Everything is permitted Please. after all, Captain. Aye, and often it is necessary. Give me some speed! Bastien Joseph, Port-au-Prince. What business do Templars have there? Captain! More French vessels at our tail! Too many! We'll retreat through the storm! We will be smashed ashore! A worse fate awaits if we let this land in Templar hands! Aye, Captain! And welcome back, guys. Welcome back. Well, you guys know that are familiar with the podcast. We are in the last section of the podcast this week. And like every week, I have to to ask you the listener the greatest listeners out there a question now of course most of us know that over the week a very interesting very interesting moment happened in gaming with the game Fortnite. now if you guys aren't familiar with Fortnite, it's a game that's been developed by epic and the interesting thing that happened was 
crossplay was turned on over the week where there was an Xbox player and a PlayStation 4 player playing in, or I should say, on the same map. Now, it has been said, this has been not so much a heated debate, but it has been a topic that's come up numerous times. Where people are saying, you know, this should be the next logical step in gaming is cross play. You know, I would like to know, I want to ask you the question, is cross play a good idea? I mean, is it really? Is this the end all be all for gaming where everybody's gaming and kumbaya, you know, everybody can pick up a game, play their friend that's on the PlayStation, on an Xbox, or vice versa, or even on a Nintendo product. Because the word, it's not even a word, it's fact that Rocket League is actually compatible, it's cross-compat with Xbox and Nintendo, as well as some other devices, well, not devices for um, Rocket League, but Minecraft is also another game that's cross-plat, you know, where you can... uh play on one platform and then it'll go over to several other platforms so that's the question i want to ask you guys is crossplay a good idea if you want my opinion and this is going to probably be a little controversial i'll say no don't do daggone crossplay forget that look nintendo microsoft and nintendo uh, uh playstation have their own platforms, okay? You play with people on that console. When you start meshing, you know, different things together, all of a sudden, now first party may start saying, well, hey, maybe this is beneficial because it really does benefit. Don't get me wrong. It could benefit players, game players. You know, you can play each other. It could be great. You don't need the same console, whatever. But it's always been, this has always been a constant when it comes to gaming. You have to give people a reason to buy your platform. I'm not a believer in the kumbaya. I don't think that all gamers should just come together under one roof and have a good time. I'm not a fan of that. Look, if you want to play with your friends, you get the console. You get the console that you're supposed to get to play with the friends that have that console. We live in an era and a time where everybody feels entitled. Everybody feels like they should get their way, even to the point where they're telling developers how to develop their games. I'm not a fan of that. I think that you should, you know, people should understand that not everything is for you. If you can only afford an Xbox, that's what you get. If you can only afford a PlayStation, that's what you get. But people think that they're supposed to be, once again, this new era, this new generation. People think things are supposed to be given to them. That is a negative on my part. So, no, I don't think crossplay should be necessary. I think, I, well, I don't think it should be the next necessary step in gaming people have been getting along just fine online on the xbox side and the playstation side of course nintendo they may need to do a little better with that but you know that that's besides the point but i want to get your opinion i want to know do you think that cross play like i said before for the hundredth time is cross play a good idea i don't think so but as always you can reach the show at 443-261-4607 or you can email the show, of course, at the Analog Circle Podcast at gmail.com. I'm sure Mr. Cody Clark is going to have something <laughs> very interesting to say. And my answer, it stands. No, don't do cross play. Keep. Things keep people and players on your console. 
because once you start cross contaminating, you know, it it it, it takes away from the flair of things. It it makes competition. It's competition. I know people are probably saying, Keon, it's just online play. Guess what, brother? That's where it starts. It starts with the online play. I do not, and I repeat this, this has been a conversation that has been going on for years where people want all of their games under one roof. I don't want that because once that happens, competition is over and what happens when the competition is over people stop trying to innovate and stop trying to move things forward because there is no reason to when you have someone like microsoft who got butchered who got fraud who got tore another one because the xbox one was not up to snuff with the playstation 4 that made them react they had to react to that. And now we're getting the Xbox One X, which is pushing the competition further. So now the next time, guess what's going to happen with Sony when they release their new PlayStation 5 console? They're going to make it better than what the Xbox One X is going to be. It's competition and it is needed. So no, I don't want to be under the same roof with the same people. If I want to play with people on that console, I pick up that console. But anyway, it's not about me at this point. It's about you, the listener. Do you think cross-play is a good idea? Once again, ladies and gentlemen, man, game players, I want to thank y'all for tuning in to this episode of the analog circle podcast what was this episode 68 of the podcast and please drop a line let me know how you feel about it but that is it for this week but that's okay that's okay because we will return next week but until then remember this it is not about the consoles, brother. Oh, it is not. It's not. It's about the games. Now, before, and I know somebody out there is going to say, well, wait a minute. You just said that you don't want everybody up under the same roof or the same console. If it's not about the consoles and it's about the games, then why won't you be such an advocate of putting everybody under one roof? It's one simple answer to that. And I said it before. It's competition. You have to to have competition in order to move the culture forward. So yes, it is not about the console itself. It is about the games, but you have to have competition. But that is it for me. And until next week, you guys take care. Be safe out there. Bye-bye.